Judges. One is Carol Arnold. I don't know if you know oh, she's, Carol Arnold. She's an amazing artist. Very good artist. Oh, God, yeah. Yep. And, and the Jim other Schmidt. is Al Weems. Uh, Al is an amazing photographer. And I've seen his work. I, I'm blown away by some of his work. I really am. It's amazing. So there are two judges. What they're going to do is they're going to judge individually. We have a scorecard that I'll put together for various uh, art associations. And what we're going to do is they're going to judge individually based on that scorecard. They're going to get scores for first, second, third in each category, and they give them the points, and then compare the two scorecards to determine first, second, third, and, and then best in the show, they'll talk about to come up with, it'll be a category, not just a point for one, you know, so they're going to talk about that. But that's how it'll all be judged. That'll be Tuesday night. Uh, Frank's going to be there with them when they, when they come in uh, Tuesday night. I was going to be but uh, unfortunately, I have to be in New York this week coming up. So Frank's going to be there. Um, and then what we're going to do is we have a few artists that are going to go there. Anne and Polo, as you mostly know Anne and Polo from here, Anne and Polo just judged Blackstone Valley's show early September. And then myself and Laura Zangetti are going to go tomorrow to judge their second fall show. Fall. So, um, so it's a great situation right there where we're collaborating together. And basically what we're doing is, you know, in a way, we're, it's, we're getting different judges coming in, which is nice, and at the same time, we're saving costs. Are they just doing a small work show, or are they doing a large They're one? They're gonna do a large one too. They're gonna come back and do a large one as well. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, and so it, it works out very well. And what we're doing then is we're taking that money that we normally would have spent on the show judging, we're putting that towards the mini workshops, which I'll talk about in a few moments. Uh, we're, trying to we're going to subsidize those. So it works out really well in both respects. Now, with the small work show, we only have 41 pieces, which is actually the smallest show I've seen for this group in the entire time of a dozen years I've been here. Um, I'm kind of surprised. I don't know if there's other people out there. I know I've just heard of one who's um, missed the drop off, and um, if anyone has missed the drop off, it was yesterday, but if you did, you can talk to Frank, uh, and uh, Frank will, and if, if, hopefully if you all know Frank, Frank's sitting in the back row back here. Um, Frank can, you know, you can arrange with Frank to get, get into the show if, it's, if it happens sooner. Uh, let's see what else we get here. Um, pick up for the small work show is Sunday, October 21st. That's at the Artist Studio and Gallery Picture Place where the show is taking place. And that same day, August October 21st, is the reception for the small work show. And really, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our fall reception. And at the same time, when you're picking up the small work show pieces, you'll be dropping off a piece of a large, really big show. 
So it all works out very nicely conveniently that way. And then the pickup for the really big show is Tuesday, November 6th. Now I apologize for the newsletter. Uh, I read through it before it went out. I didn't catch this, but it did not have, the October one did not have the drop off or pickup times. Uh, it's talked about the show, but didn't have that. The September newsletter did have it all in there. So, um, but, so that's what the shows. Any questions on the shows before we move on? Okay. Didn't you say the times were to pick it up for the large piece? So, uh, November 6th to Tuesday, 3 to 5 p.m. Okay. That way Frank can go get his dollar burgers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a football game Sunday before, so we want to have it on Tuesday. Yeah, it makes sense. Plus, yeah. I have a bird. That's important. Yeah. Oh, you can't beat it. Valui for dollar, dollar burgers? Yeah, good Where? burgers. Yeah, two Valui in Patriot Place. If you haven't been, yeah, it's, good. We look, it's, nice it's fantastic, yeah. and it's not yeah. just it's not just a, a it's not a little burger. It's a it's a good sized burger, and you can get a mushroom burger if you want, or a vegetable burger, or a chicken a chicken cutlet not cutlet chicken breast. Oh, okay, and, and they're all a dollar. Yeah, you know you pay for all the little extras that you want. But, 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 still a box. but even then, I mean, even then it's a most times, thing. most times my chip is more oh, than my, my bill. That's true. Right. Yeah. You know, it's nice for the buns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did want to mention the dues. If you ha if you have forgotten, get you know please submit the dues. Uh, I was one of the forgetful people. Uh, I just got mine in this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I understand. If you forgot, I understand. And then um, we do need, Adele was just telling me, we need a person to help Adele out. Well, there she is. I'm going that way. To help Adele out with, uh, Adele's not going to be around December, January, February, or March. And Adele is managing the people who bring the food. Um, I asked her, so what do you call that rule? And she says, hospitality person. That's what someone said, the coffee lady. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I want to run you down for food. <laughs> but we need somebody to take the list that Adele has and just on those months before call individuals, let them just remind them. Yeah, also, somebody has to bring the coffee pot. Okay, That's okay. Back so, there. There's a coffee pot and there's some supplies. Okay. On a wagon, okay. So. so we need someone to help out with that. If someone wants to volunteer for that, it's just December, January, February, March. Uh, Adele will be back at that point and ready to, ready to, to keep to get more, more rolling again. Where are you going? Getting a new knee. She wishes she was going somewhere good. Yeah. I know. I wish. Rehab. And then regarding food, there's a sign up sheet going around. You have it? Okay. Right here. Adele has it. Uh, it, it says your name, the month that you would bring it in, your phone or your email, and that way, sometimes people write these things in there and they get something comes up, and when they, they, I notify them and I'll say, oh geez, I'm not even going to be around. Well, at least it lets me know that I got to go pick up a few extra things and get reimbursed by Jim over here. If you, Is the you coffee know. ready yet? Oh yeah, it's in the, it's in that back okay. room. So I'll pass this around and. If you put your name, the month you want to bring it, your phone number, your email for someone to get in touch with you. Would you pass, pass it this way? And... and then I want to talk about October 27th to Saturday. And we're going to have a paint out at Patriot Place. Patriot Place is having their harvest festival that same day, the Ocean Spray Harvest Festival. Uh, it's a great festival that they do. I think, I think it's one of my, one of my favorites. Uh, because the restaurants all have a little stand out in front, a little tent out front. And I think it's like two to four or something. They have a signature dish out there that you can go up and get for nothing. Uh, it's pretty cool. It really is. And there's a lot of fun activities going on. The band's playing. And we're going to have a paint up to go along with that. So if anyone here, I'd love to have all of you come, come join us. I've also reached out to a couple of other art associations as well. And I talked to them and see if they want to participate as well with us. So uh, hopefully we'll get a few people to come. What's a paint out? What it is, it's 
we paint the building. <laughs> we, 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 paint, we paint outside. You bring your easel, bring your art supplies. We paint outside. We all get together. But the, the last time we had it, we had like 10 artists came together. We all painted outside the art gallery. And it's just a fun day, you know, to get to come together with the other artists and talk about different things and, you know, uh, enjoy the, the, the scenery around. And you have a lot, of, because it's the Harvest Festival, a lot of spectators walking around. Oh, you get to see your art, get to see what you do. I always tell people, don't just bring the piece that you're painting. Bring a couple of finished pieces that you have as well to put beside your easel. And that way people can see what you, not just what you're working on, but what do your finished products, your finished pieces look like? You know, when is this, Jack? October 27th. Oh, okay. It's a Saturday. We haven't done a paint up in a long time. I know Ralph comes to every one of them. We did the uh, one not make this one, this one though, one. because <laughs> I'm drive and I work. My, my show for what we got. Uh, I work on Saturdays. I'm uh, okay. at Target. Uh, you know. Um, cool. Yeah, and, and, and I always say, if you're gonna, and we have room inside too. If you don't want to paint outside, there's room inside as well. What time is the paint out? It's going to be one to four. Because there's a workshop that same day, right? Sorry. There's a workshop the same day from yeah. 10 to 12.30. Cool. Yep. Yeah, that's the one that Sherry's going to do. And if you're going to be painting outside, bring something to anchor down your easel because the paint your place is the highest point of Foxborough and there's always some wind dust coming through. Okay. So I would say bring a, you know, like an a, 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 a empty water jug or something, an empty milk jug. You fill it with water at the art gallery and, you know, something maybe a, a, um, a um, bungee cord or some kind of rope or something just to anchor down your easel. And to anchor your, your easel onto, your painting onto the easel. And then I see a few new faces. Great, and this, this, this uh, meeting here. It's great to see it. I know we have that new member challenge that I kind of put out there. And the reason for all that is because even though we have a growing membership, and we have a very, I think we have a very good membership, uh, very diverse, you know, very, you know, as far as, even in, as far as age, uh, where a lot of art galleries recently, the members are getting older, they're not coming to meetings, they're not participating, and, a lot of art associations are struggling right now. Um, they're getting the, the membership is dropping and dropping and dropping. We're not. We are growing. That's fantastic. Uh, but I want to keep it growing. And um, so that's that's why I did that that challenge. Try and get if we can. I know it's a lot. To try to get 25 new members this year. Uh, all right. It's great to see. It really is. I was thinking that one selling point might be that there's no commission on the work if it is sold, which is unusual. I mean, mm -hmm. most other organizations take a certain percentage. Yeah, yeah we, we try not to. I mean, mm. um, even at the art gallery, we have the guest artists at the art gallery. Yeah. Um, you come in, it's $35 for a weekend, and there's no commission charge. Mm. Uh, at some point, that may have to change. I don't know because yeah. I, you know, the costs keep changing. But if we can keep the cost down, we will have to keep on doing that. Mm. So it is. I, I agree. I think it's great. And the other, the other selling point is that we do that through the night gallery yeah. that's associated with this group. That you have a place where you can go and show your art, and a place where we can go and show our our, our, our um, shows, where other art galleries don't have that. Not other, other art associations don't have that. So. Um, we are very lucky in that respect, and we're lucky to have a, a big active group. We've been around for what, 60 some odd years, and we're still a very active group. So it's fantastic, it really is. Can I just ask you, is that Jerry Ace's, it's 10 to 12.30? 10 to 12.30 on the, on the 27th. And is it full? Uh, there's still a couple of spaces still open okay. that I'm aware of. And I was gonna get to the workshops right now. We have Jerry on the 27th, they're all, ten, they're all on a Saturday. They're all 10 to 12.30. We call them mini workshops because basically what it is, uh, you're not gonna have, you're not gonna walk away from the workshop with a finished painting. But you're gonna get a lot of ideas, tips, thoughts, um, 
things that you know, if you've never done watercolor, like myself, I've never done watercolor. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. And, okay, now you can't go wrong. For fifteen dollars, it's twenty-five dollars for the for the for the for the uh, to attend. But the art association is gonna pay ten dollars now. So for fifteen dollars, you can't go wrong. For a Saturday morning, two like and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. So Jerry's the first one, October twenty seventh. Then we have Ann uh, Ann Gorbett. They're doing a pallet knife. The president's clothes. President's clothes. Okay. Okay. And then we have Laura Zin Getty, in December first, and she's doing oil. So, uh, and if you know Laura, uh, Laura's an amazing artist too. I mean, they're, they're, they're all great artists. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's a great situation. And then, I think that's it. Well, you know, that's it. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, we're ready. It's all, it's all yours. Um, I just want to say we got Mona Dumoulin Cross, uh, native of, did I get it right again? You did. All right. That's a beautiful thing. Native of Taunton, um, pastelist and oil painter, member of the Pastel Society of America, and also the Pastel Painter Society of Cape Cod. And I've seen some of your work before I came here to check a look and see what you do. Great work. Really good work. It really is. So it's all yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Is my mic on? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Oh, you have a mic? Yes. Yeah, that's nice. I do have a mic. Can a you light. hear me? Am it's I on? Okay. I got a green light. <laughs> yep. I'm technically challenged. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Mona. I've been doing oil painting since I was probably about eight years old. Um, but in the last eight or ten years, pastels got me. <laughs> so um, with oil, I paint everything, very few human portraits, but pretty much all the subjects you can think of. But with pastel, this is the only thing I love. So um, if I didn't have a chance to chat with you, this one is named Brady. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. <laughs> and uh, that one is Maisie. And so I thought tonight I would do one of my dogs for you. I have Shelties. And uh, so I've got to get started. And my big question is, can you see from, I can turn the easel, I, and please feel free to come closer. I want you to be able to see everything that's happening. And so this is one of my reference photos. This is my guy, Cooper. I had cheese in my hand. It was not for him. But if you look at the face, you know he's quite pleased and quite intent. The only thing is the color, you know. Oftentimes I will work from black and white and then just work my own color into it. But this is another shot of him out in the snow. So I have him with some color references there. So this is kind of a, a mix between the two. Um, for paper, I use Color Fix by Art Spectrum. And I have a scrap of it here somewhere. Is anybody? The only paper you use? It's the one I use most of the time. You can pass it around if you want. It's kind of very. Um, does anybody use sanded paper? No. Can I ask you a question about the, the selection of the color or the background? Sure. Dark color. Does that tend to make it darker? No, I tend to go with a medium to a deep value in my paper. Um, I'm not fond of the white paper. I know some people will put a color wash on it with watercolor or with pastel with alcohol. This makes life so simple. You can find a color that really seems to enhance the piece. So sometimes I'll use the terracotta. Um, this is the aubergine. And there's one, the burgundy. Those are the three favorites. They, when I'm trying to choose the color, this is a question I ask all demonstrators that do pastel, because I could never figure out what do you do for colored paper? Like, how do you choose? Well, you try to figure out a paper that's going to save you some time and trouble. What will make it easier? Where will you see that color pop through? Now, with his color, I could easily have used the terracotta because he's got that beautiful, rich color. But for the shadows in his big chest hair, this color works really nicely for that. So I can let a little bit of it peek through. If I had a pale color and it was showing through in places, 
say with Maisie in the dark areas, it would look unfinished. It's kind of like a, an oil painting where you've left a little bit bare by mistake and it always looks a little bit, oops, somebody forgot that. So if you have something that's a little bit deeper, oftentimes it'll be a color that I use in a shadow that I'll use for the color paper. But what I'll do is find a photo that I want to use and I will try it up against different colors and see which one takes some of the work out for me. Which one will it, do I see it in the shadows? You know, do I see it in the highlights? It's usually not so much the highlights, but on occasion it will be. So you just find a color that you think is going to make your job a little bit easier. Because painting's tough enough, right? Yeah. So that's why I chose this. And I usually have just a little piece of scrap here so that I can test colors on. Um, questions about anything yet? You just, picked, you just answered my question. My question was, why is there a yeah. green line down the middle of it? <laughs> yeah, yep. it's funny. The things that people ask you at demos, the thing that got people at the last one was, I have black gloves on. I was thinking, well, I'm going to ask you more. <laughs> and someone told me it was <laughs> ominous. I thought that was the funniest thing. I'm like, the reason why I have the black ones is because um, I also do oil. And these are automotive nitrile gloves. And I wasn't sure if the exam gloves, which are those pretty lavender and blue and lovely colored ones, I didn't know if the solvents would eat through them. But since these are used by mechanics, and they're just as thin as the others, chances are they're not going to be eaten away, so I can use yeah. them no matter which medium I'm using. So you the can colors, reuse them. No. You can. Oh, I didn't know. Does anybody here wear gloves when they paint? Do you reuse your gloves? Turn them inside out sometimes. If you can turn them inside, that's the problem. Yeah. When you have them on, your hands do get sweaty. Yeah. And so if yeah. you take them off and then try to put them on again, yeah. you have to blow them up like a balloon and yeah. try to, yeah. it's, it's not so much fun. So usually, you know, we just, yeah, they're disposable. Right. It, it works out pretty well that way. They do, box of 100, just like exam gloves. So. What do you call them? Mechanics. They're nitrile gloves. And I get them at an auto supply place. And they come in different colors, but I figure I'm safe if the automotive techs can use them. And yeah, and it matches them. Yeah, it matches your outfits. <laughs> I thought ominous was a funny adjective, though. I thought, really? <laughs> and the green tape. Some people use gray. This is frog tape. If anybody has painted their living room lately, <laughs> this seals nicely on the edges. And it's delicate so that it doesn't tear the paper when you take it off. So. And you just sketch it up with a pastel pencil? I did. I did. Oftentimes I use charcoal, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of messy looking when I start off and uh, doesn't bother me, but I think this would be easier for you guys to, to see. Um, I'm going to be moving back and forth here between the colors, so if I'm in your way or if you want to move, please feel free to come closer if you want to see anything. You can stand behind me. I, I'm used to a very small group and I'm very, very casual, so please ask anything and if I don't know the answer I will try to find out for you. And a little but bit after eight, we'll take a break okay. and then come back to it again. You can keep on doing it if you want, or you can stop and let people come up and whatever you want to do. Yep, and feel free to ask me, like I say, ask whatever you want. Um, and usually, this is just a value strip that I've made up. I don't know if anybody uses these, but I find them very, very useful, particularly if I'm going to work this way. I can test the color, figure out the value of an area that I want. Like this side of him is darker by his ear. And if I find the value that I'm interested in, it looks like it's going to be the dark gray. When I find a color to use, I'll put it up here. I don't know if you've had this problem, but when I look at a color, it may look dark. And then I'll test it, and it's not as dark as I thought it was. So that's one nice thing that you can do with this. You kind of shop for your color. And most of the time, I don't wear my glasses when I paint. I like it a little blurry. I need them to dry. Strip, that's also useful if you take a, port, a picture of a picture mm -hmm. to put into a show okay. online. You put that next to it, then you go to Photoshop, you can click on the white and the, and the grays and black, and you'll color fix so the original colors will look nice. on the digital screen. I need to learn Photoshopping. I haven't got there yet. But that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, the most important thing, really, once you have your sketch on, is knowing your values, figuring out your oh, values. Yeah. The colors really don't matter. Um, if you see my business card with the sheep, there's a lot of bright turquoise, and that was taken from a black and white. So there's like 
invented color that you can throw in, but if the value is correct, it's still going to look right. It's, so we start with value, and the next thing is temperature, the warms and the cools. If you can find your balance with those, the rest of it's kind of a breeze. You know, you can go oh. to a degree. Yeah. To a degree. It, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it if you can get those parts in. So this is Cooper. So we're going to start him with some of his deeper tones. And let's see. A little bit more than that. Usually I'll find a test one, and then I shop with it. I'm looking for this, but slightly cooler and slightly darker. And then I can kind of compare. Pretty close match for his dark hair. So usually I open in broad strokes to begin. There's a lot of frill. We have a, um, a 14 week old Sheltie puppy of my son's at the house. I have two. The one that was in the newsletter is his litter mate. So I have two. They're almost six. My son has one that's a year and a half. And he got the puppy two days ago. Um, no, well, they're just visiting from Virginia. My boys are in the service. So he just got the puppy day before yesterday. So we have him for another day or two, so I'm very excited to. Hard to break away from the puppiness. It's, it's so wonderful. Yeah. It's hard to put him down once you pick him up. They're just so darn cute. I have no idea. <laughs> brown? It's a brown tone. Okay. My guess is it's yeah, like yeah, this one I probably one of the Sennelier's. But once the wrappers are off, I truly have no idea what color it is. Yeah, go with the values and, and try to find the right temperature, and then I don't worry too much after that. I do. I do. I was saying before I got this nice human box, I used to put all my different separate boxes into a little suitcase. And when I went on location, I would bring that with me. And I knew which colors were in each. Well, you would think this would be lighter. It's not. <laughs> but it's more organized. So that's a plus. But um, yeah, we still carry a lot. And the box is kind of heavy. But I don't worry about the names of anything. You know, as long as it will fit the bill. What's that? You know what you need by looking. Yeah, pretty much shopping around for a nice cool color. And this is his shadow side, so we'll see if we can get some. What do you do to keep them clean? Hmm. With pastels? Yeah. Or yeah. um, cornmeal. Cornmeal? Yeah. What do you guys use to clean your? I use rice. Rice? I find rice. It's good, but this is almost like an exfoliator. If, if you've ever used cornmeal, I've got a little container of it with me. You just put it in and roll it around, yeah. just wipe it off. Yeah. You don't even have to wipe it. Oh, it comes out that clean. Wow. It's like exfoliating you know, your skin. It's very, very easy. You just take a color in, shake it around. It's clean. It's easy. Cornmeal. Like you would get in the grocery store. Wow. And this one's a little bit dirty. I keep my um, charcoal in there. Mm -hmm. That way I can travel with it, it doesn't shatter as much. Um, That's and the first I've ever heard. Cornmeal. Cornmeal's so easy. 
Um, and when it gets really dirty, you just dump it out and fill it up again. Cornmeal is really inexpensive. Yeah. Obviously, keep it dry. Yeah. Don't Do you have any hot pastels? Yeah, I've got some new pastels in here. Um, there's Rembrandt's, there's Boombacher. Just a little bit of everything. You know, you know how it is. We acquire <laughs> as time goes on. and <laughs> Yeah, you try not to collect too many, but let's face it. It's like candy. You gotta live. You gotta. It's so much fun. So, I've, I've got these boxes of Terry Ludwig back here that I've probably gotten in the last year or so, and they're delicious. They're so rich like and, and wonderful. They really are. The Sennelier's are too. The only thing is the Sennelier's shatter. So I have a lot of wonderful tiny pieces, but they're kind of hard to hold on to. You want to use the glass. You want to use the glass couple. I have <laughs> until it disintegrates, but this is a lovely box of intense darks. Mm -hmm. And um, I was saying I had used used to just do oil, but I'd taken a class with um, Kim Weinig. Weinig. Yeah. Kim introduced me to sanded paper and dark pastels. Mm -hmm. Game changer. <laughs> I you know everybody used to say oh you've got to use Canson paper. Anybody love Canson paper in the room here? Yeah. I tried to love it. It didn't love me back. <laughs> it, it didn't look rich, it looked very, I don't know, very flat. The artwork never really had that richness. And I've had people say these look more like oil paintings. I don't mat them, I, I do spacer bars, mm -hmm. so that probably adds to it a little bit. But um, yeah, you get that richness and you can get so many more layers of color mm -hmm. with sanded paper. So once I realized this is on the market, and I've tried different ones. There was a Kitty Wallace paper, which I believe is off the market now. Yeah. That was as, it felt like an emery board, yes, like you would, like a nail file. Um, I've used that before, but it does kind of gobble up your soft yeah, pastels. Yes, it it's really kind of rough on it. Um, so this one's kind of a medium value or a medium grit. It's not too gritty, but it's enough where you can get some nice layers. And I don't use a fixative. Somebody was asking about that earlier. Does anybody here like fixative? Okay. Do you use it at the throughout the painting or just at no, the just end? At the, at the end. The thing that I've been told is that it changes the colors. If you use a lot of it, if you're just very light on it, 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 it doesn't. Okay. Um, I tried it as a kid. My Our teacher used to spray it right in the room with us, oh, yeah, and it would just fun. burn. And I thought, no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. If you go to the trouble of finding the right color, I don't want it to change. That's why I don't do watercolor and acrylic. Acrylic dries darker, watercolor dries lighter. Oil and pastel, whatever color you get, is what you get. So I kind of like that, getting what I intended. So I don't use fixative. Um, I have nothing against it if people find that it works for them. I know some people do it during different stages of the painting to kind of push the pastel back into the paper more. Is it really healthy for my brain? I don't use it. Um, I don't have problems with this. These are not sprayed. Um, this one is probably five or six years old. There's no dust. Um, it's got a spacer bar, so any dust would fall down in there. But I don't find that they shed the way we're afraid they're going to shed. When I use the cans and the smooth or the unsanded paper, it sheds. Not very well. There's only so much layering. So when a truck drives by and it rattles, they shed. So these, luckily, they seem not to. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. You named it uh, Brady five or six years ago, before the. She knew all along, just like we did. <laughs> okay. Was it a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of a given. It's Tom Brady. Usually, since I started as an oil painter, I start with my darks and move toward the lights. It's kind of the, like I say, it's very much the same between oil and pastel, except this is dry. And generally speaking, I find I don't make mud as badly with pastel as I do with oil. You don't have to mix. You don't have to worry about how much medium you're using it must to get be the nice consistency. Well painting with that because your colors are already mixed, except for small light. I've not plain aired with pastel because the only thing I like to paint with pastel is animals. Yeah. I've gone plain air with oil. 
which I enjoy doing. But really, lately, I just want to do animals. Humidity does does the job on the pastels if you're outside. I mean, it really just uh, yeah real difficult. There's a bit of that gummy feeling you get yeah, as yeah, they get yeah, a little bit yeah, squishy. Yeah, it's, it's not sick. so great. So I think the, the darkest things we have running are his nose and his eyes. Sometimes I'll save the eyes and do those later, kind of as the cherry on top, um, and kind of wait. But I don't want to do that. Oops. Let's see. The only issue I find with these, these intense darks, they're so dark you don't know what color it actually is mm -hmm. until you test it. What it's, brand are those? These are Terry Ludwig. And there's some sprinkled in here, but they're packed beautifully. And this box in particular, this is um, the Maggie Price grays. So they go in value from light to dark in different variations of gray. So why mess up and make me dig for them? They're right here. So I like to keep these in the box just <laughs> organized. Yeah. It just makes the job easier. I like simplicity. Whatever makes it easier and, and more simple and makes my job easier is what I like. So let's get his eye in here. nostrils in there. Another thing that I found some pastel artists have a problem with is finger blending. It's like the sin of the pastel world. Well, I do finger blend sometimes. Um, you can need to. With this one here, when I put this dark side in, you really need to push the black in if you want that to stay in shadow. If not, you're going to have bits of purple popping through. So if there's a, a strong value change or a big temperature change, I will oftentimes at the beginning really push it into the paper and rub it in. And that's pretty much it for, for rubbing. At the end, if you want to soften and get that really soft fur, very selectively. There's not a whole lot of that going on, but I didn't realize how stressful people, it was on people when you finger blend in front of them. Their pastel paintings, oh, I can't believe you're doing that. It's okay. It's just pastel, it's just pigment. It's, it's, it's okay. No one's going to get hurt doing this. Your references are so dramatically different. These two? Yes. They are. And wh what are you going to determine as the basis for the dark or the light? Well, here he does still have a light and a dark side. Even though he's looking straight at me, the light's stronger on this side. If you okay. look at his muzzle, He's got more lights over here. So the light's coming in from the left. Yeah. It's coming in from the left. Yeah. It's not exactly the same, but it's coming from the same direction, and that's in my favor. Okay. If they were coming from opposite sides, yeah. I would just work off one, yeah. because that's a little bit too much to struggle with, especially in front of all you guys trying to figure out how the light works. So He's got lovely colors, so. I'm going to look at his the shadow side of his muzzle. Um, one thing that I do look for is color harmonies. 
And with him, he's between an orange and a yellow in his warm areas. So his complement is going to be a blue-violet. So when I'm looking at the white part of his face that's in shadow, that's where I'm going to lean to. So let's see how this one turns out. This is a good time to check that. I find this particularly tricky when you're looking at a white fur in shadow. How dark can it be that it doesn't look like a change in color of their fur? Um, so trying to guide with this one. And squinting is usually the easiest way to find your value, see if it's correct. Looks like it's going to be both. It's dark. That off. I'm going to look for a warm yellow orange for his highlighted area. This is usually going to, I've actually been asked if this is fluorescent. You can take a look. This is about the color of my flesh tone. This is not, but because it's the complement, it usually is quite dramatic. Normally, I like to go a little warmer and a little bit darker than I actually want in the end, because that's too light. <coughs> and the light is coming here, which means it's going to hit his throat. Questions? Yeah. Under what kind of light lighting do you work in your studio? I have right hand there. Um I I have fluorescence up above, so some of them I alternate. There's a warm and a cool bulb in each one. Warm, cool, cool, warm, to try to balance it out. I do have a light that has, you know, the natural bulb in it. I find sometimes it's too blue though. So, what one called blue light? Yeah, it's a little bit, it's like being in an office sometimes, it's a little bit too blue, but that's all right. What do you guys use for lighting? Does anybody have like a great light? Yeah, yeah. window lights and daylight bulbs at night. I have an ought light, and that works pretty well. It's kind of heavy, you know, the one that mounts to the easel. But that's okay. Um, that's kind of a nice thing to use. It really, yeah, changes things a lot. So if I can get natural light, that's what I really like to use. But sometimes it'll pick up. My studio is actually in the basement, and it's painted yellow. Oh. for the warmth to beat the coolness of the room. So if I take photographs down there, they're horrible because everything is, is tinted yellow, but it does help a little bit. Um, and then when I'm almost done with the painting, I'll bring it upstairs. You should put it on the fireplace so that when you're watching TV, you can, look at, you can look at it and I keep a notepad next to it. So anything that I find that needs to be corrected, 
I make a to-do list because you don't want to go and just start painting. Oh, I'll fix it. I'll just repaint that and I'll repaint that. Well, you won't have any tooth left. And then what do you do? Um, you're kind of in the in the weeds at that point. So. So would you end up removing some color? Yeah. And. Sponge brush. I've tried different things. I've tried a stiff um, bristle, like an oil painting brush. I find if you're too vigorous, it actually lifts the sanding off the paper. And that's really difficult. If you have, say, the whole background, if you decide you're going to put a scene back there and you've lifted off, it gets tough to get the pastel to stick if you've lifted it off too many times. And one painting I lifted the background off, I think, two full times, the whole background. And luckily, the, it stuck with the third layer. But um, yeah, changed my mind. <laughs> so I try not to do much with this. I think of it for emergencies only. Because if not, I teach and I have students, if they'll try to paint with this in their hand. And they'll make a stroke, and then they'll erase. And then they'll make a stroke. It's not good. It, it never comes out as nicely as you would hope that it would. So try to get that point across. It's not always welcome. But eventually, you figure out what works for you. And a lot of erasure doesn't really do nice things. say I shop. This one is looks to be about the same value but a cooler version. So we'll see if it's darker. Sometimes they surprise you. It's about the same value but cooler. So. And you need to think of the direction of your strokes because you're really trying to mimic the growth of the hair. So you know I'm not going to you're not going to see me do this. Mm -hmm. on a dog who has fur because no dog has fur that grows sideways. So you, you have to really think how do you get a three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional surface? How do you get that to look like it has some depth? You have to kind of build the texture and go with the way the fur grows. So this is a cooler one. Look like they have a mustache under their little nose because the skin is actually black underneath the fur there. So, the dogs actually kind of look at any of these paintings and wonder if they're real dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, they look into the glass on the fireplace and think there's another Sheltie in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, they're bright, but no. I've seen dogs look for dogs on. Yeah, my other Sheltie, um, we had to teach her not to attack the TV. <laughs> she used to lose it when Tom Brady was on um, because there's a dance and a song that happens when we score. I don't know if your family has anything, but there is. My husband's up on. He doesn't like it. You know, well, she thinks it's time to. She sees something on TV that's got dad on his feet and yelling and singing and dancing. It's a rare occasion. So she thinks she's supposed to. So she literally, she's this big. She's 14 pounds. She's very tiny. And she throws herself at the set. And we found it was, it was Brady that she was going for. 
And it was like, we don't ever bark at Tom Brady, girl. <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, maybe, but not him. Never. It's unacceptable. Um, or Edelman. We don't do that here. But anyway, so now I, I said to my husband, the only way to stop this is scoop her up and let her be part of the dance. And she's fine with that. But if not, she thinks she's tr cheering him on by diving at the television every time and barking like he's, I don't know what. Um, but she's protecting I us. I probably find that interesting. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure if she, but she just thinks she's doing her job. And I said, that's not your job. <laughs> your job is to cheer on, not she to be foolish. Like <laughs> yeah. But she's, she's six now, or almost. So she's figuring it out that we don't like when she does that. I don't see many dogs like that anymore. Is that Shelfies? Yeah, you don't. Um, when you see them, oftentimes they're in pairs. Mm -hmm. And we just came from Maine. We were there this weekend, and we saw two or three more. Oh, really? You start to see them like in, in little clusters. We were saying we don't see collies much. We don't. No. And I think, and people always say, oh, is it, um, is it a miniature collie? Well, there isn't anything. There's no such thing. But people know collies because of Lassie. So they know the way the coat looks. So they always say, oh, it's a mini Lassie. No, not really. They're distant cousins, but that's okay. At least they're, they can identify it. Most people don't even know what a Shetland Sheepdog is. They just think it's a miniature collie or something. But no, there are no such things. Or I have one by now. <laughs> So you got four major collies in your house, you know what you said? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, have, I have yeah. some beautiful pups. Wouldn't trade them for anything. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do much with the background on this or not. I haven't really given it much thought. But this paper is what I used for Maisie, but if you take a look at it, there's oh, more color. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's the base. The but then there's some warms and cools that have been pushed into it, even yeah. though it you know, naked eye, it looks the same as this, but when you get up there, it has more intricacies going on. It's a great background. It, it works nice. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, with my paintings, I, it's not that I want this to look like a Sheltie. I want it to look like Cooper, mm -hmm. my Sheltie. Yeah. We had two right. before this. Personalities. They have oh, personalities. Yeah. They have different looks. So, you know, it's it's the bond between a dog and or any companion animal and their person. If you can capture that look in their eye, it kind of reflects the love back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're aiming for. It's, so soft it's not easy it's sometimes, but mm -hmm. oh, they're wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Sweetest dogs. So, yeah. I'm gonna do a little bit with the eye because. A lot of people like to see how you work up an eye. And uh, it's kind of one of the things we do later on, but. At 8 o'clock, does the bidding start for the artwork? Or do we have to wait for the end? <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe there's a raffle on, on an owl over there, Dan. Yeah. Um, in this piece, the light is coming from this side. So. Anybody do, I know that you do people. People, animals, anything with eyes that you're used to painting? So when you're doing an eyeball, it's pretty much like a marble. So if the light's coming this way, obviously we have a pupil or a pupil in there. But the rest of it comes through on an angle. Light travels in a straight line all the time. Can't take a bend. It, prisms, you know, are a different deal. But light travels in a straight line. So when it hits here, it will travel right through the eyeball that way. So the lightest part of the iris is here. And the highlight sits there. So if you just remember it goes in a straight line, eyes aren't really that difficult. Hands, hands are hard. And again, would work color into the eyeball. And there's usually a lid. Something that 
is there. But the lightest part, you can get that lovely glow if you keep track of where the light is coming in. And it really does pick it up. So it's not all that complicated. It's just a matter of knowing where your light's coming in. So this is coming. It's hitting that side pretty strong. Here. The other thing that I always want to be aware of is the focal point in your painting. Um, with him, this side around this eye is really where you want to look. I mean, you can look at him anywhere, but that's where I'm kind of drawn to, where you've got the, the best contrast. So that's the eye that's going to be worked up more. Yeah, that one also has the light coming from that way. So. Usually, I, when I start to detail, I start at the focal point and then work out from there. Um, this is the part where it gets a little bit. I love the dark in. I know it's horrible, isn't it? It's dreadful. How could she do that? There's several layers that are going to go up on top of this, and those don't get blended with my fingers. But at the beginning, I want to kind of push that base coat in. work this base in a little bit. And then I want to come in and work on the muzzle. It's going to be short strokes to mimic the direction of the fur. For the sake of time, I'm kind of jumping around to mm. a little bit of the end work so that you can see how that develops a little bit. He's got a line. It's eight o'clock. It is. Well, everybody go get a snack. <laughs> and I'll play with this. And feel free to come on up and. <laughs> interested in hearing more, please feel free to move your chairs, come close, stand behind me. It's all good. As long as you can see what's going on. And During the break, we were talking about these, in case you didn't hear the conversation. This is a camera blower, and it's to get the lint off of your camera lens. And it's got quite a good amount of force to it. So this blows off the extra dust. Oh, um, yeah. One of the that would work. Yeah, we listen to you. Yeah, so that would. Keyboard. Mm -hmm. I thought of that. I didn't know if anybody had was using those, but I found this you know was a very easy thing. Nasal aspirators for babies are similar. Um, one thing you never want to do is blow on the painting, yeah, yeah. and I think it, you probably all heard that. But in case you didn't. A little bit of your saliva is going to land on it no matter how much you try to avoid it, it will happen. And it will leave little dots that you can't paint over. There's a little bit of oil in them and it leaves stains. Those little dots will always be there. You really can't get them to go away. So you don't want to ever do that. The other reason is you want to blow on your painting and have that dust up into your nose and into your lungs. It's not good for you. Just don't do it. So you can tap. That works pretty well. And before I frame, I'll take it out, turn it upside down, and 
spurp the heck out of it, really spank it good, and get that, that extra dust off. But before I put the glass on, because there's always static with the glass, I always give it one last, I'll clean the glass with this, because there's static that builds up when you go to put it into that situation. I use a clear spacer bar. But you're still close to the glass, and it will pull the dust right onto the glass if there's anything loose. So you clean your glass again on the inside, and you clean your painting again, and anything heavy will shed off. So invaluable. If you, if you don't have a nasal, nasal aspirator, if you have one of these, they're worth it. They're really worth it. So that's my pretty boy over here. Any thought of any questions they have for me? The size you typically work at? I do a lot of um, 12 by 12, the square ones. I'm, I'm finding, especially when you have one where the, the critter is looking directly right, at you, okay. it, it's a nice format for that. Okay. Um, I use 9 by 12s a lot, too. Those tend to be my, the two sizes that, that I do most of. I have a couple. I'm working on a Bernie's Mountain Dog right now. And the Bernie's big, so it's an 18 by 18. Yeah, well, you can't put a, a big breed on a tiny piece of paper and expect that it's going to look normal. It's just going to feel wrong. Just like I wouldn't do an 18 by 18 with a chihuahua. That would be frightening. Like, it, 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 it feels wrong. So, a 5 by 5 chihuahua. Well, I did a Pomeranian um, as a commission for a friend who's in um, Washington State. And I did it on a 10 by 10. And that worked out well. It was a tiny bit larger than life size, but it still kept with the character of the dog. So you kind of have to think about not only the client, where they're going to put it, you know, is the size going to work for them, but also the breed of the dog and the character of the dog. So sometimes you have a small dog with a big attitude, so you can go a little bit larger on your size, but you still don't want to go too oversized, too much more than their natural size would be, because it just doesn't feel right, you know? So that's usually how I gauge those. But these are probably the ones I do the most. Um, I'm not great with miniatures. If I, I've never done anything smaller than a eight by 10 with pastel. I find it, I have to really be tight. I can't be loose at all. I have to be very tight and controlled. And that's not as much fun. And I can't really get the detail without getting too picky. And I, I want to save my pickiness for the focal area. The rest of it really, when you take that away, it's not really that fussy. But this is the stuff, it's that little extra stuff in the focal area that works for you. So that's what I do there. thing that I will start to do is once I have put the local color on, once I get a little bit further than this, I'm going to start to look for the complement in my shadows, where I've got some of the purple here, but over here I'll see them too. Like in this picture, I can actually see, I don't know, the photo processing, a lot of people, you know, say photos lie, and they do. Sometimes they make the color too bright, and they change the color, but because the processing if you look at this part of his face right here, what color of the rainbow do you see underneath my finger? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, or purple? There you go. This is a copper color dog. Can you see the purple right there? So that makes your job easier. Sometimes photo processing, it seems like, oh, well, if you know that it's going to lie to you, you can still take a little bit of truth from that. And seeing that cool tone that I want, like, well, can I find a cool brown? Sometimes you can find a cool brown. Sometimes they're still kind of coppery. But once you can identify another color in there that's cool, meaning green, blue, or violet, life is good. You don't have to worry about brown anymore. You can go to the color that you see. So this part over here is actually going to have some violet in it. What's missing? We, these dogs have what I call the Cleopatra line. From the corner of their eye, there's a black line, looks like eyeliner, mm -hmm. that cuts right here. And um, 
comes down on an angle and it's lighter on the fur here and it's darker above it but it comes right out there just like Cleopatra with the, the liquid liner so that's missing sometimes you don't know until you look and go when they get so small you can't hold on to them. Oftentimes at the beginning I leave these strange gaps in it because I don't really, I never work one area to finish at once. Mm -hmm. I jump around so yeah. I would prefer to leave gaps where I can see the paper so I know I haven't filled the tube and I'll get to that area when I get around to balancing it out but I didn't stand back during break so I'm gonna it's a good idea to see what's it looks, happening it looks very different from way way back I was back gonna say again. but yeah. it, it, at least it looks canine yeah. <laughs> you never know when you're working on it does it look like a live animal <laughs> but he's a little patchy but it's okay. okay he has a cast shadow here which I feel should be darker. So I'm actually going to lift a little bit here because it's getting kind of thick. Sometimes I test right on the painting, which is probably not the best thing to do, but we do it sometimes. Okay. He's going to have light coming in here. His muzzle is causing a cash out, so we're going to have a little bit more light on top. get down to the more finished areas we're going to bring up our warms our highlighted areas a little bit more slowly so if it's part that's being hit by the light I make it warmer and deeper than I want it to be at the end and that way I can add the highlight on top of it if you go from a very dark color and then you try to put a highlight on it directly um, it has a very strange look. If we build this, go a little lighter. Your highlights become more believable. But if you just jump to, there's a coldness and it doesn't mesh well. So, I always go darker. Like this is going to end up being very pale. It's going to be like the light part of her muzzle. But you have to build it first. So a little warmer, a little deeper, and that gives you room to play to get to the value that you want it to be. And the light should be coming in here.
easier when it's blurry. I'm not sure why it's easier when it's blurry, but it, it kind of feels, I don't get too tight until the very end. Anybody have any questions for me? No? Okay. Not often. Um, it's not my strong suit, to be honest with you. Um, landscape, still life. In oil, I, I do, I've done a couple um, oil human portraits, but they're few and far between. Um, I wish I was better at human portraits, but it's just not really as much fun as this. The other thing with this um, textured paper is you just get wonderful textures. And animals have amazing things happening, whether it's feathers or scales or, or fur. You can just build it up and get that feeling to it. Flesh is different. If you're a portrait painter, you know. It, it's a different game. You know, <coughs> mostly smooth skin. So, you know, I, you look at pastel different. I mean, than I do. I'm looking for the textures, and you're probably looking for the smoother papers or transitions. Yeah, with this, I'm you know I look for the growth of the hair, and I, I want to build up that all that wonderful texture that you get on undoing the animals. So that's what I like to do. So once I get it, the base coat on, I tend to start to pay attention to the direction of the fur after that. Back up. 
Does it look all right? Oh, it looks gorgeous. It's it's in the back. back. We're looking yeah. at the back. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, that's the yeah. thing. It looks great you know, in the back. It it's looking kind of here mucky too. up here, but, uh, yes. but like I say, I usually take quite a bit of time when I get to um, oh, sure. the detail part. When it's, I really This isn't something you can finish in a few hours. Oh, you no. really can't. And actually, when I did the demo for that one, I had about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, <laughs> How do I do a portrait in 45 yeah. minutes? Well, you but it's a good start. To it, it's more yeah. of um, showing the different steps of it. Yes. So I, I would do the something. eye and, and kind of bring it up, but you can't really do it all. Yeah, you can't. There's time just to get the detail work. You can't. So how much more time will you put into that? Mm, that's a good question. A couple of weeks. Okay. It kind of depends. Yeah, I mean... I, I like detail. I, I want it to look like my boy. Yeah. And again, there are four at my house right now, and they all look different. Their faces are very different. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it to look just like a Sheltie. I want it to look like Cooper, yeah, my Sheltie. It's, it's important, you know. and it takes a while to start to get the personality in. Yeah. So while well, that's blocked in, and take a peek. Yeah. It's, it's not it's not a bad start. He's, right. he's come along. Um, he looks a little messy to me, but that's okay. My standards for what he should look like is a little bit different. But when I get talking, I sometimes don't, can't paint talk at the same time. So, yeah. We know you love him. We can tell Oh, I adore him. And sometimes, actually, the ones that I know work very well myself, I paint faster because I know their personality. And actually, when I do commission work, I don't always get a chance to meet the animal because one was in Seattle <laughs> and had passed away. You know, a lot of them are posthumous. What are you going to do? What I like to do is ask the client, could you describe the animal to me? What were they like? And when you hear a person's words, oh, I love them so much. That's the be all and end all. You now can feel what they feel. So if you've ever loved an animal, then you can understand when you read their words, you know what that is, and then you translate it. So my own dogs, it's easy. It's faster. Somebody else's animal, this Bernese Mountain Dog, I've been on and off this thing for over a year. When I first started doing it, I had just started the painting, and I found out that she was going for chemo treatments. Oh. Dog had lymphoma. Oh. And the woman described her as, she's my heart. Oh. She died before I finished the painting. Oh. I couldn't work on it for months. You had to kind of felt some love. Oh, it just broke my heart. And then in the meantime, she had a second one, had to put her down about six months ago. Oh. Oh. I'm like, I... <laughs> I need to breathe. Yeah. I, I tend to, um, I'm rather empathetic. I get extremely emotional about it, as you can tell. So, um, baby Gracie is not finished, but it's not the dog, it's the background that has me stumped because she's described this dog is very childlike, innocent, um, rambunctious, and just would bound into everything. She fell through the ice one year up in New Hampshire, and the other dog pulled her to safety. She's like a child, a huge child. And to this woman, it was her baby. So when she lost the second one, I'm like, oh. I'm thinking, how do I present this animal to her, knowing that this painting is the last image that she will see? Oh, yeah. And that she'll see every day. It's like, oh. It's putting your heart and soul into them. So she's not done. And it's the background trying to figure out how to present it as well as I know how, never having met the animal, but just from her words. And the woman has a horse farm. So the background, there's a, the landscape of that. And I have her jumping into some delphinium because the meaning of delphinium fits her personality. So even though they're poisonous to dogs and I wouldn't naturally put them in, they're tall enough that if you had a Bernese mountain dog, you would actually see them behind her because those dogs are huge. Yeah. What flowers are tall enough that speak to the meaning of the flower or to the personality of the dog, that don't detract from the animal, that read the dog's personality enough that the owner 
will see it and have happy thoughts. That's why she's not done yet. <laughs> yeah, she's probably not there yet, but she is. No, but she's been asking, um, have you started, Gracie? And I'm like, mm, yeah, I have. <laughs> but we kind of hit a wall whenever I found out that they had lost her. And then yeah. I found out that she had lost the other one, and then that her partner came down with breast cancer. Like, this woman's life is caving on her. <laughs> and I'm like, more pressure, at least in my head, that what I can do, I've got to figure out how to make it right. But you know what? You hear that from them. It will be right. They will. It will? Yeah, yeah. yeah it will be right because they, they can see the love that you put in. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm kind of dragging my feet because I can't. I'm not confident that this is the best way to portray her. I think we're there, but I'm still like, mm. so. It's so most it's, of the time they don't take that long, but this one really just knocked me over. So would you show somebody a picture of what you've done so far? And I do have a picture on my phone of where get, she's at. Get feedback from them or get? No, usually not from the person um, who owns the animal. I would rather get the information from them because then I have to digest it and find a way to get that, the way, what I feel from her words, into it. And if I ask her, well, this, you know, this or that, she may try to superimpose other things that I'm that I don't find that important. You know, I want the animal to look right, but it's really the whole package of trying to get it so that it hits all the right notes, and especially on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there with Gracie. She looks so intelligent and smart. He and is like he such a love. Yeah. And if you've ever known a shelter, they're known to be barkers. This dog only barks if he's running and chasing a ball. Or Tom Brady. <laughs> no, his sister. He, he never barks at Tom Brady. He's a good boy. <laughs> But he's a lover. <laughs> no, he's not. He just wants to cuddle. But um, the puppy tried to dominate him, tried to get up on his back, and he just looks at him like he won't even defend himself. He will lie down and be like, nope, it's okay. You can, you can bite me. He's just such a love. So he's extremely smart, too. But we all think our dogs are the smartest. Was that? I say you're in the right field for painting It's, you know, I just thought for it. Sometimes too much. <laughs> like I say, Gracie has come to a screeching halt several times, but um, but it's okay. And I, I've said many times, I could finish the dog part of the painting in an hour. That's the easy part. It's the whole thing. It's the presentation. It's the memories and what it's going to bring. And this is what she'll look at when she's thinking of her. And to get the right emotional feeling to it that's the part that's got me a little bit back and forth but she's coming and like I said the dog is the fun part I've, I've stopped working on the animal and I'm just work, trying to figure out the background so that, that reads appropriately for the animal the animal is the easy part because I, I already love that dog like I love mine she's not even here but I do so. So I know everybody probably wants to get going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, I've got a card here. You can always get in touch. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.